This is Chicago. At the dawn of the 21st century, Chicago's media was dominated by a handful of major corporations. But a resistance movement arose to free Chicago's media from their clutches. One player in this movement is the Chicago Independent Media Center and its TV show, Chicago Independent Television. The Independent Media Center is a worldwide network of grassroots correspondents committed to using the tools of the media for promoting social and economic justice. You are watching this month's dispatch from the Chicago Independent Media Center. Welcome to Chicago Independent Television. A collection of progressive video reports by grassroots media workers produced free from commercial support or influence. In this episode, We'll go to the streets to join recent organizing efforts at a fast food franchise, and one that you won't expect. We'll also see the fourth and final part of a four-part series of lectures about the struggle over freedom of speech and action on the internet, the policy known as net neutrality. Here at Exxon, we hate your children. We all know the climate crisis will rip their world apart, but we don't care because it's making us rich. That's right. Every year, Congress gives the fossil fuel industry over $10 billion in subsidies. That's your tax dollars lining our pockets. Making a fortune destroying your kid's future? At Exxon, that's what we call good business. ExxonHateYourChildren.com. Members of Occupy Chicago held a Christmas celebration called Occupy Your Kids, which included food, games, art, and of course, pointed political commentary. The fast food franchise Freshy, noted for its salads and healthy foods, has been a focal point of Chicago organizing for workers' rights. We'll learn about those unionization efforts in this segment. I'm here today because I was fired for concerted activity. My boss was stealing our wages and I had access to our system. So I went into our time punches and examined when we were clocking in, when we were clocking out. And it turns out that we were being robbed about $100 per person per paycheck on average. I put together a spreadsheet showing what we were clocking in and out as, the total time, what we were actually being paid for, um, help kind of, um, I guess we, we gathered as a group so I could kind of show everybody like what it was they made and then what it was that they didn't actually make. Um, we decided as a group to march on the boss and present a demand letter demanding our recognition as a union, our unpaid wages, and a change to his wage theft policies. And to that we got part of the money that I requested. Um, there are still some people who haven't received their back wages. And then once he realized it was me that accessed the system and made all of this possible, I was promptly terminated. It all started when we found out that uh, our time, or uh, I'm sorry, our paychecks have been coming up a little bit light. We were able to obtain our time card information, even though Peter didn't want to hand our boss Peter didn't want to hand it out over to us. We found that uh, workers were owed almost two thousand dollars in stolen wages. We had an initial march on the boss. We demanded the payment of the stolen wages and the recognition of the union. 
Um, we recovered the majority of the wages, so some of the wages have still not been paid in full to workers. Uh, since then, he's ignored our calls to recognize the union, to sit down and meet with us. And uh, two workers have been fired. One worker was fired immediately uh, after the action. We did a phone zap for him, and at that time, yet another worker was fired. We're out here to support the rehiring of those workers, as well as other workers who have uh, faced um, um, action against them because of their support. I personally took a week off sick. It was authorized, and when I came back, I've been caught to only eight hours. Definitely, I feel like this is a result of my open support in the union. We have another worker who uh, found out about this picket, showed his you know, excitement in the morning um, on Friday, and then he got fired before the day was over. So we've got a brand new slew of people in there trying to bust the unions. We're out here to demand the rehire of those workers and to show support for recognition of the union, as well as to recover the last of the stolen wages. which was approximately 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, corporate came in with Peter. They gave me my check for my wages that were owed to me that I had been shorted, along with a letter stating that I was being terminated for illegally accessing the system um, and releasing information to third parties. And in this, they were completely incorrect because, A, I had the accessibility to the system. I did not hack their system to get the information that I had. And B, I did not release it to third parties, I released it to the employees. You're watching Chicago Independent Television, celebrating our 10th anniversary and our 100th episode. Chicago Independent Television presents Profiles in Cowardice with Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel. At the 2012 Montrose Beach Kite Festival, held the same weekend as the 2012 NATO Summit in Chicago and co-sponsored by the NATO Summit and by war contractor Boeing, Mayor Rahm Emanuel made an appearance but abruptly left. Why did he leave? Was there a policy emergency? Was the Kite Festival overrun by lepers? No. Chicago's badass mayor was running away from the combined strength of two protesters. Political public relations stunt, and everybody can see through it. You give kites to kids in America and drop bombs on kids in Iraq. You drop bombs on kids in Afghanistan. You drop bombs on kids that speak Arabic. No to NATO. No to the war mongers. No to Boeing. Go home. Because you're a bunch of murderers! And now Rahm Emanuel is off to go fillet some lobbyists. This has been Profiles in Cowardice. The Federal Communications Commission is crafting its policy of freedom of speech and action on the internet, known as net neutrality. Chicago played host to his recent series of lectures on this topic. We'll now see the fourth and final part in this series of lectures as an extended segment. Welcome to Omega. This is the fourth of four lectures on net neutrality. And we covered a lot in these lectures. We reverted, we've reviewed the definition and details of net neutrality. We reviewed the definition of the term, why it's necessary, and what's at stake in the fight. 
where you've looked at the history of net neutrality in policy, in law, in the courts, and in the court of public opinion. We've now come to today, the summer of 2014. On May 15, 2014, as was mentioned before in previous lectures, the FCC approved a docket. This will mark the third time that the FCC will attempt to craft policy on net neutrality provisions with the previous two times defeated in court. In a significant development, the FCC has included Title II classification, the formal policy involving public service, common carriage, and non-discrimination among the policy options included in the notice for proposed rulemaking. This development is a credit to what is arguably the largest number of comments, an estimated 3.4 million so far, who commented on the FCC on net neutrality in what appears to be the most of any single issue in the agency's history. The FCC will accept initial comments on the docket until July 15, 2014. From July 14, 15, 2014 through September 15, 2014, the FCC will accept replies to those initial comments. You can comment through the FCC's website at www.fcc.gov slash comments or use the handy online forms available at www.savetheinternet.com, one of the coalitions that has been working on net neutrality in recent years and in the past. If you do nothing else on this matter, I strongly encourage you to comment and ask, demand, that the FCC reclassify the Internet as a Title II telecommunications service. I would like to address a point now regarding all this activism and the futility that might be perceived around it. A lot of non-activists, and even a number of activists who disdain getting involved in matters of policy, will understandably scoff at getting involved with matters of trying to influence, influence government policy. There is reason to be cynical. The FCC, as the record long shows, is more a handmaiden of corporate power than an advocate of the public interest, convenience, and necessity. Officials at the FCC, far more often than not, use the FCC as a stepping stone to positions within corporate media and aligned industries, positions that are much higher paid and with far less critical scrutiny or awareness. But we have also seen that corporate power can be defeated. Recall the media ownership by the 2003 the comments that were submitted to that docket, both in their quantity and their quality, were exactly the reason why the lawsuit that overturned the media ownership rule demolition that the FCC tried was successful. Andy Schwartzman, an attorney who argued that suit in 2003, recalled the comment by the judges at the time that a million people, in quotes, wound up actually being more like three million people, but a million people commented on the docket in some way, and that that flood of commentary should matter. And that therefore we, they, block the FCC rule rewrite, which they would have otherwise seen billions of dollars of sweeping mergers and acquisitions across our entire media landscape in just a few months. But ask yourself, how did millions of people know about the docket to comment on it, where before the major media who sought to cash in on the rewrite were effectively mute on the matter in the run-up to the FCC's vote? In sum, it was because of growing activist efforts in communities across America who saw what was coming and who raised the alarm in every way that they, we, could. Predictions be damned. Those activists also caught a number of lucky breaks along the way, and the FCC's short-lived policy victory wound up being a pyrrhic victory and ultimately into a full-fledged defeat. We could see something similar on the FCC's docket on net neutrality. The numbers are certainly there for a populist-fueled victory, with possibly more numbers to come. And there are promises of a lawsuit, regardless how the ruling slants. The problem for net neutrality advocates is that, as we've seen, using the courts to defend net neutrality without a reclassification of the Internet are probably not going to work. But fortunately, that's now abundantly clear. What's more, Given the threat that a reclassification would have regarding certain public services, for example, the use of voice over IP telephone for 911 emergency calls, as is increasingly the case, it becomes all the more necessary to reclassify the Internet to prevent the kind of degrading service for profit that net neutrality advocates fear might happen. This is why some analysts think that the FCC eventually will come around to reclassifying the Internet back into a Title II framework. But predictions about the fate of net neutrality aside, 
We should not rest on our laurels, regardless how the net neutrality wars of 2014 turn out. The reason is that there are deeper issues at play that also tie into net neutrality, and I'd like to devote the remainder of this lecture to addressing some of those issues. In brief, I'd like to address the reactive nature of political activism, the role and fate of markets in the net neutrality fight and in society more generally, and the critical juncture, the rare opportunity that we face in our current time. As we've seen, the fight over net neutrality has been punctuated by intense times of great activity, like the fight over the COPE Act of 2006 and the net neutrality wars of 2014. But my point here is that such activism is less about being active and more about being reactive. It seems that we're always fighting to stop something, usually policies that are driven by corporate diktat. Seldom are we setting the timetable or, heaven forbid, setting the agenda. Please note, what I'm about to discuss gets us somewhat removed from the discussion of net neutrality, but the matters are clearly connected. Corporations that have a stranglehold on our political process and the possible fate of net neutrality and by extension of the internet and the future of our communications, and for that matter, most everything on earth, it's critical. Just ask any environmental activist, ask most any activist. The aim of a corporation that's faithful to its charter is continual growth at the expense of everything else, even if, especially if, it leaves destruction, sometimes death in its wake, just like a cancer. But actual physical cancers include at least some potential concern for the cause of that cancer, the carcinogen. Continuing with this metaphor for a moment, if a corporation is a cancer, what is the carcinogen? There are clearly a number of factors that are play that cement the prized position of corporations in our day and age, certainly in the United States. The Corporation, a documentary film and namesake book by Joel Bakken, delves into some of the history on this. But there is one potential carcinogen, a major factor affecting the oversized influence of corporations and impacting the fate of net neutrality and much else, whose criticism is as big a taboo as any in our day and age. I'm talking about markets. Markets, the main allocation mechanism of our economy and of the world economy, where buyers and sellers compete against each other, as do buyers against other buyers and sellers against other sellers, with prices serving as a mark of bargaining power. It is regarded as an article of faith, practically, that all this competition engendered by markets is a good thing, that the proverbial invisible hand will guide good results out of these competitive interactions. And yet, the candle lit by market faith is blown out by the evidence. We see that across industries, across sectors of the economy, markets concentrate. Over time, fewer and fewer producers hold more and more control. And given the market dynamics at play, that makes sense. In an economy where you either eat or be eaten, it makes sense to be a monster. And a corporation is the political economic equivalent of a monster. If criticizing markets for good reason is taboo, then so is calling for the abolition of markets and their replacement with a more participatory economy that won't result in these corporate monsters holding disp disproportionate sway over the internet and over our lives and over the planet. Yes, we should call for, we should demand that the FCC reclassify the internet as a Title II telecommunication service. But should we win the net neutrality wars of 2014? That won't stop the looming threat of corporations hovering over everything, constantly reacting to everything ready to roll back our hard-fought wins. We need to stop playing defense, constantly reacting to everything that corporations do. We need to start playing on offense by calling for a better economy that would make these life-threatening and net neutrality-threatening corporations shrivel and die. Getting into the details of what that kind of economy would work, would look like, should work, would require probably at least another four lectures. But for the time being, I would recommend two books for people interested in exploring this topic. One, the book Of the People, By the People, The Case for a Participatory Economy by Robin Hanel. Two, the book Real Utopia, Participatory Society for the 21st Century, edited by Chris Spanos, which I should say in the interest of disclosure, I helped to contribute a chapter to. I'll admit that this proposal, abolishing the markets that spawn corporations in order to help preserve net neutrality, might seem to some people a bit extreme, maybe even unrealistic, to which I would say, yes, of course it's extreme and unrealistic. Realism in this context is just another word for cynicism. 
Many of the winds of social justice in contemporary times were deemed in advance to be unrealistic. Ripping the veneer of legitimacy off our financial system in 2011 with a ragtag effort called Occupy Wall Street was unrealistic. Stopping the FCC's media ownership rule demolition in 2003 with an unparalleled mass uprising was unrealistic. Stopping the World Trade Organization's Seattle Round in 1999 with massive and concerted street protests was unrealistic. The list can go on. In fact, I dare say now that I dare say that now is the time, more than ever, to pose the most unrealistic proposals you can think of. And there's a reason why. Social change doesn't always happen in a linear fashion. Sometimes it can get very dramatic and very deep and very fast. These opportunities for deep social change have to do with what are called critical junctures. These are once-a-generation opportunities for deep, dramatic, and quick social change. But these opportunities don't last very long, perhaps a decade or two. I'll quote, a length, I'll quote at length from a book that discusses the idea in detail, Communications Revolution, Critical Junctures and the Future of Media, by Robert McChesney. McChesney writes, quote, The decisions made during such a critical juncture establish institutions and rules that likely put us on a course that will be difficult to change in any fundamental sense for decades or generations. When it comes to the history of telecommunications technology, McChesney further writes that critical junctures in media and communications tend to occur when at least two, if not all three, of the following conditions hold. One, there is a revolutionary new communications technology that undermines the existing system. Two, the content of the media system, especially the journalism, is increasingly discredited or seen as illegitimate. And three, there is a major political crisis, severe social disequilibrium, in which the existing order is no longer working and there are major movements for social reform. In the past century, McChesney continues, critical junctures in media and journalism occurred three times. In the progressive era, when the journalism was in deep crisis and, overall, and the overall political system was in turmoil around the year 1900. In the 1930s, when the emergence of radio broadcasting combined with public antipathy to commercialism against the backdrop of the Depression. And in the 1960s and 70s, when popular social movements in the United States provoked radical critiques of the media as part of a broader social and political, political critique. I believe that we are in another critical juncture now. Two of the circumstances are undeniably in place. One, a revolutionary new communications technology that undermines the existing system, the internet. Check. Two, the content of the media system, especially the journalism, is increasingly discredited or seen as illegitimate. America's journalism was asleep at the switch on the 2003 invasion of Iraq, the Great Recession of 2008, the great NSA privacy invasion, among many, many other stories, while our extant newspapers are collapsing and journalists are getting laid off in droves. Check. Is there a major political crisis, part of the third criterion for a critical juncture? Is there severe social equilibrium in which the existing order is no longer working? Same part of that third criterion. Again, these are debatable points. What's the threshold for severe social disequilibrium? But it is clear that things are and have been out of whack. I just mentioned some examples of this. Are there major movements for social reform? Again, a debatable point. When does something qualify as a major movement? But things do trend in this direction, without a doubt. Despite the suppression of the Occupy Wall Street movement, many of those active in the Occupy movement are still active on various initiatives, even if those, even if those efforts are not widely known. Those efforts are coupled by growing and active efforts on, you name it, immigrant rights, economic justice and living wage efforts, the environment, particularly the climate crisis, LGBT rights, justice along gender lines, media reform, media justice, the list goes on. So it seems we've come close if we're not already at our trifecta, our hat trick, our triple crown, the three circumstances that are emblematic of a critical juncture. So is that it? Will positive societal change now simply play itself out, with net neutrality being one of those changes? I'm inclined to say, not quite. While there's coordinated efforts, while there's a lot of motion on various fronts, no denying that, there's little in the way of coordinated efforts towards some grand unifying end. 
These efforts, all of them, need to s some center of gravity around which to rotate, to crystallize, to coalesce. Again, Robert McChesney, along with co-author John Nichols, make this point in a book called Dollarocracy. McChesney and Nichols write in Dollarocracy, quote, There is more than sufficient demand for reform, and there are more than sufficient reforms under consideration. But to our view, there is an insufficiency of focus. There needs to be a unifying theme that will galvanize the movement and enhance its power. From this enhanced power, and only from such enhanced power, can foundational democratic reforms emerge. This is the last great challenge in shaping the current movement for reform into a necessary transformational politics." End quote. McChesney and Nichols suggest as their unifying theme the act of voting that has animated so much political activism throughout American history. I myself have offered a second potential theme, the abolition of markets and their replacement with a more participatory economy. Doing that, I surmise, would decapitate the corporations that threaten net neutrality and much else besides. No doubt others can and have offer other themes, to which I say, please do, and let the debate begin. The sooner we can argue through these potential unifying themes during this rare opportunity, this critical juncture, the sooner we can coalesce around one, the sooner we can enhance our growing power, the sooner we can change the world for the better and help net neutrality along the way. In the short term, again, I encourage you to contact the FCC, so ask, demand, that they reclassify the Internet as a Title II telecommunication service. You're watching Chicago Independent Television, celebrating our 10th anniversary and our 100th episode. This is Dan Lin from the Illinois Chapter of Normal, and you're watching Chicago Independent Television. In 1914, Woodrow Wilson signed the bill that created the Fed. He thought it was one of the worst days of his life, and he had destroyed the country. He hadn't destroyed the country. He destroyed the world. Put an end to this now. This is Jeremy Scahill, and you're watching Chicago Independent Television. Make ChicagoActivism.org your homepage. All the news, events, and contacts for activism in Chicago. The Chicago Activism News aggregates content from over 100 activist organizations from around Chicago and Illinois. There is also a search bar along the top if you want to search the web using Google, making it convenient to have ChicagoActivism.org your homepage.